It takes 19 organ implants to transform a regular human into a Warhammer 40K Space Marine. From this? Company Command, this is First Platoon. We've lost the square, we can't hold it. To this. In my first video on this topic, we talked about the overarching space marine creation process and if it is possible with modern medicine. The answer? Modern medicine can do some pretty incredible things and I suggest you cue that video up for later to find out what they are. But we fall short in the area of custom lab grown organs with genetically engineered evolutionarily advanced functions. So today we're going to take an in-depth look at the first group of the gene seed organs and I will attempt to provide the closest possible modern solution for each of them. Meet Billy, a young space marine neophyte who over the course of this video will undergo many surgeries as we attempt to transform him into a full-fledged Astartes with all of the abilities presented in Warhammer 40k lore. We'll have to exercise some creative liberties since we are attempting these operations 38,000 years ahead of schedule. Let's pretend the world government has given us carte blanche that Billy's body will not reject any organs and see what we can do. Billy definitely has his work cut out for him. At age 11, he'll undergo phase one, the implantation of a second heart called the maintainer. This organ resembles a smaller version of the human heart and is implanted in the chest cavity and connected to the rest of the neophyte's circulatory and pulmonary systems near the original heart. Its function is to enhance the performance of an Astartes by supplying more oxygen and nutrients to the muscles by increasing blood flow well beyond that capable even in the most fit normal human being. In our present day world, a heterotopic heart transplant is a transplant procedure that allows a donor heart graft to be connected to the native heart in a parallel fashion. The main advantages of this procedure is to assist the patient's native heart and to maintain the circulation in the cases of severe acute rejection of the transplant. An article from the UC San Diego Health, Two Hearts Beat as One, explains that the new heart is positioned on the right side of the patient's own heart. The donor and recipients left atria filling chambers of the heart are surgically attached to each other allowing bright red oxygenated blood in the patient's original heart to flow to the new heart. It is then pumped by the new left ventricle into the patient's aorta, which brings new and increased flow to all parts of the body. This procedure is typically a last line of defense when a patient's heart is experiencing irreversible hypertension or there is a severe size mismatch between their heart and the donor heart. Because of this, there isn't really research on heterotopic heart transplants in patients with normal heart function. More is not always better, but it looks like Billy is okay, at least for the moment. Now, according to Warhammer lore, it is possible for a neophyte to undergo phases one through three simultaneously. Thus, he will also be recovering from the implantation of the os modula, colloquially known as the iron heart. This is a small tubular organ that secretes hormones to alter the ossification process of the skeleton and encourage the formation of bone, which grows while absorbing ceramic based chemicals that supplement the Marine's diet. And as a result, the subject's long bones will increase in size and strength along with most other bones. What do you mean by that? And the rib cage will fuse into a solid, bulletproof mass of interlocking plates. Built-in body armor, very convenient. But not so great for chest expansion and breathing. Big shout out to Beards BL over on Imgur for these images and theory crafting. You're definitely putting your Masters of Science in Biomedical Visualization degree to good use. Cha-ching. The iron heart implant is surgically placed alongside the neophyte's pituitary gland at the base of the brain, thus becoming a part of the Space Marine's endocrine system. You may be surprised to learn that we routinely perform endoscopic surgery on the pituitary gland, which is a small bean-shaped gland situated at the base of your brain. 
somewhat behind your nose and between your ears. Surgeons approach the gland through the nose, creating incisions and bony openings in the nasal septum, sphenoid sinus, and cella. A tiny endoscopic camera and light provide visualization to allow the removal of tumors with long instruments. A similar procedure could be used to implant the os modula next to the pituitary gland as suggested in Beard BL's incredible artwork. Modern science has designed hormone secreting pellets which are typically implanted under a patient's hip. And then I will pull that out, put my pellet here, and then use this to insert the pellet. These pellets measure approximately three millimeters by nine millimeters and contain crystalline testosterone. These pellets are no larger than the tumors which sometimes develop on the pituitary gland. So there is enough room to implant one alongside the pituitary as instructed in the lore. Unfortunately, the Marine would have to undergo this surgery on a recurring basis every three to six months as the pellets do not regenerate new testosterone once their stores have been depleted. A study conducted at the University of Southampton in England on extremely short but otherwise healthy children showed growth hormone injections applied in doses over the course of six months to increase height by up to three inches. Despite its potential to increase height, growth hormone therapy can cause early onset and completion of puberty, which paradoxically shortens the growth period and leads to premature closure of the ends of long bones, which may limit the final height. So we may need to adapt other means to achieve the Space Marine's imposing stature. Contemporary limb lengthening surgery deploys strategic bone breaks and requires the insertion of a device that lengthens the bone as it heals. This technique could be used to help increase the size of our Space Marine candidate, in much the same way Jack Hanma increased his own height in the anime Baki. An adaptation of this limb lengthening procedure could be used to increase the size of each individual rib and transform the rib cage into interlocking plates. Each rib would have to be broken and a device implanted inside of it so that it would stretch as the bone heals. However, the size increase required in each individual rib may be too large to achieve without a bone graft or metal insert. Companies like Atra X are on the cutting edge of developing new, more effective bone grafting material. And while their version of a ceramic bone graft has an optimized surface that has been shown to drive increased bone formation and faster fusion than traditional ceramic bone grafts, it is not yet possible to direct a healing bone to grow into an evolutionary shape. The interlocking rib plates aren't coded for in a normal human's DNA. So in order to achieve the desired result, a metal or carbon fiber composite material with the desired shape would be inserted and attached to the broken rib bones with some combination of grafting and surgical hardware. In the near future, it may be possible to employ a ceramic scaffold in the right shape, constructed to mimic the mineral phase of bone. The porosity of the scaffold would allow for mesenchymal cell adhesion, proliferation, and differentiation into mature osteoblasts. We have a total of 24 ribs to break and adjust, so needless to say, this would be an extremely difficult and invasive surgery that would require a long painful period of inactivity to heal properly. Good thing Billy is a trooper. Phase three is the biscopia, a small circular organ inserted into the chest cavity that releases hormones that vastly increase muscle growth throughout the Marine's body. It also serves to form the hormonal basis for many of the later implants and can be introduced alongside the two aforementioned organs. In the strictest sense, human growth hormone is responsible for both bone and muscle growth. Growth hormone regulates bone and muscle growth and physical development. So a second organ administering the same chemical would likely be counterproductive as high levels of human growth hormone over a long period can produce irreversible acromegaly. <laughs> But even smaller doses can lead to complications such as heart disease and diabetes. However, there may be another way to increase muscle growth, as I mentioned in my video breakdown of Master Chief's biological augmentations. Growth differentiation factor eight, more commonly known as myostatin, is the protein that controls muscle growth in another way. It is essentially a negative regulator of skeletal and cardiac muscle, meaning that the more myostatin you have, the lower the limit of your muscle mass. Thus, our muscles have a control mechanism that sets a limit to their size. When the gene responsible for producing myostatin was deleted in developing mice, there was an increase 
in muscle mass. Follistatin was first popularized when it was discovered that it quadrupled the muscle size of myostatin deficient mice. Mice that lack the gene that creates myostatin have approximately twice as much muscle mass as normal mice. The number of muscle fibers increased called hyperplasia, as did the size of these fibers, called hypertrophy, and the effects remained observable throughout the life of the mice. This experiment was actually the one that established the effect of myostatin on muscle mass, and the inhibition of myostatin has a similar effect in humans, though not necessarily as pronounced as it is in mice. Flex Wheeler was revealed to be one of only nine extreme responders that had a very rare myostatin mutation and the result of this mutation is a much larger number of muscle fibers than in the average male. Follistatin has emerged as a powerful antagonist of myostatin that can increase muscle mass and strength. Follistatin was first isolated from the ovary and is known to suppress follicle stimulating hormone. The typical daily dosage among follistatin users is 100 to 300 micrograms injected directly into the specific muscles the user would like to boost. I guarantee you're gonna get a great, great result. Well, Billy, you've dodged an operation this time. Phase four is the hemostamen, which is a tiny organ implanted into the main circulatory system, a main blood vessel like the aorta or femoral artery, that increases the hemoglobin content of the subject's blood, making it more efficient at carrying oxygen around the body and turning the subject's blood a bright red color, which is a good thing considering the fused rib cage, which would be a negative contributor to the oxygenation of blood. The redness of a human's blood does indeed depend on its oxygen content. So this tidbit of lore checks out. I'm not sure how red a human's blood can actually become, but generally the more oxygen present, the brighter red it is. This occurs because of hemoglobin, a component of red blood cells to which oxygen binds, allowing them to pick up oxygen oxygen in the lungs and release it to different parts of the body as it travels through our circulatory system. In order for Billy to increase the hemoglobin content in his blood, he will require a diet high in iron. See, our cells require iron to produce heme, which is the protein precursor to hemoglobin. Typically, iron intake is boosted with nutrition and supplementation, so our Marines can look forward to a diet high in iron-rich foods, such as shellfish, spinach, liver, organ meats and legumes. Unfortunately, high hemoglobin levels are associated with some minor health complications, and our Marines may experience dizziness, easy bruising or bleeding, fatigue and joint swelling, among other things. The hemostamen also serves to monitor and control the actions of the os modula and biscopia of phase two and three respectively. Simpler non-implant hormonal monitoring devices or kits do exist that monitor testosterone by sampling one's bodily fluid, urine, saliva, or blood. A crude modern solution compared to the sophisticated implantable devices in the Space Marine, but a solution no less. And although I can conceive of a small wireless implant that enables us to monitor the hormonal content in the blood as it passes through the main blood vessel, then transmit that information to a receiver outside of the body, a device restricted to the inside of a blood vessel may not be the optimal location for something that is said to control hormones. Adjustments to the supplements administered in phases two and three would then be adjusted manually. A device that interfaces directly with the brain, such as Elon Musk's Neuralink, may be better located to perform this function. The neurons are like wiring, um, and you kind of need an electronic thing to solve an electronic problem. In an interview conducted in 2020, Elon claimed that his device can also control hormone levels, helping relieve anxiety and several other mental problems. Neuralink will send and receive electrical signals to and from the brain, allowing it to interface directly with the advanced functions of the human brain, such as hormone synthesis and regulation. This year, the company plans to test on human subjects, but when it does, what would this major step mean for brain implant science? Maybe Elon is willing to conduct his clinical trials on our space marine <laughs> candidates. Otherwise, we may have to forego the hormonal control aspect of the hemostamen. Perhaps a timed iron release capsule could be inserted into a main artery, releasing iron directly into the bloodstream. Any technology of this type would have to fit into an extremely small package as the diameter of the abdominal aorta 
is less than three centimeters and the femoral artery is usually between seven and eight millimeters across, about a quarter of an inch. In phase five, we arrive at a new level of science fiction with the Laramin's organ, which produces the entirely imagined Laramin cells. These cells are released into the bloodstream when the Marine is wounded, attaching to the white blood cells and traveling to the wound site where they react with air to create an instant patch of scar tissue. With it, little Billy can look forward to numerous and prominent scars, such as those pictured here. Or here. Being a space marine is clearly a tough job. The only issue is that these cells don't exist in our world. Typically, our platelet cells fulfill this function, but to a far less effective degree. When we are wounded, our blood begins to clot immediately, but the full scarring process as the wound dries out and cells begin to heal the damage takes much longer, typically a few weeks. Platelets or thrombocytes are small colorless cell fragments in our blood that form clots and stop or prevent bleeding. Platelets are made in our bone marrow, the sponge-like tissue inside our bones alongside red and white blood cells. And our space marines can boost their platelet count by eating leafy greens, fatty fish, folate, iron-rich foods, and citrus fruits. Yeah, I'd imagine the contemporary space marine is going to have a pretty stringent dietary regimen by the time we finish this video. Phase six introduces the catalepsian node into the space marine anatomy. This pea-sized organ is implanted at the back of the brain and influences the circadian rhythms of sleep and the body's response to sleep deprivation. When a marine is derived of sleep, the catalepsian node switches off areas of the brain, sequentially allowing perception of their environment while resting. This process reduces a Marine's need for sleep to four hours a day and allows them to go for up to two weeks without it. Facing monsters like this on a daily basis, I'd want to be alert while resting too. Looks like they definitely mean business and who knows if they even need any sleep at all. Guess we'd better come up with a solution for the catalepsian node. Researchers at Stanford actually found that small regions of the brain cycle in and out of sleep when we are awake. The cycles shift toward awake when a part of the brain pays attention to a task. So to a lesser degree, our brain is already doing what a space marine brain does. But Although the longest recorded time without sleep is approximately 264 hours or just over 11 consecutive days, the effects of sleep deprivation start to show long <laughs> before that. After only three or four nights without sleep, you can start to hallucinate. Our cycles of sleep and wakefulness are regulated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN, residing in the anterior part of the hypothalamus, which is located behind the thalamus and above your pituitary gland. Remember the location of the pituitary? We accessed it through Billy's nose in order to insert his os modula. Between the pituitary gland and the neighboring hypothalamus, many important endocrine system processes occur at the base of our brain, directly above the brainstem. The SCN resides right in that neighborhood and any attempt to alter our need for sleep would likely need to alter its function. Our circadian rhythm is influenced by light and dark, as well as other factors. When darkness comes at night, the SCN sends messages to the pineal gland, which triggers the release of the hormone melatonin, which then makes you feel sleepy. This gland is located towards the midline of the brain further back from the pituitary and the hypothalamus, outside the blood-brain barrier and attached to the roof of the third ventricle by a short stalk. Due to the fact that the catalepsian node is located closer to the back of the brain, it is possible that it is meant to bypass the SCN entirely and inhibit the melatonin production directly in the pineal gland, causing marines to feel less sleepy. But if this were to occur, the SCN would still be directing the cycles of other systems and structures throughout the body. If the central pacemaker of the body becomes compromised, the timing of hormone release, metabolism, and other processes may become disturbed 
and a cascade of problems that could occur from there. In order to maintain optimal function in other systems, we need a more holistic approach. Altering our sleep-wake cycle isn't as simple as impeding the function and light detection of the SCN either. The body is carefully tuned to take full advantage of rest-wake cycles in order to maintain optimal function. If the body never receives the cue to rest, it will slowly but surely shut down. Even if you don't feel tired, like when you've had too much caffeine Want some coffee? Want some coffee? or taken a stimulant. Hi, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, could I get 100 cups of coffee, please? You're ready to go into human clinical trials. That's the evidence the FDA is looking for. Now, there is the possibility that Elon's Neuralink can alter the brainwaves of the patient directly with its impressive array of 96 small flexible electrode threads with 32 independent arrays per thread, totaling 3,072 electrodes per array. In the past, deep brain stimulation devices have allowed for control of computer cursors, robotic limbs, and speech synthesizers using a lot less more than 256 electrodes. Elon has stated that Neuralink will be able to read, clean up, and amplify signals from the brain. This is significant because as we will soon see, our dominant brainwave pattern at a given moment directly affects our body's need for sleep and ability to recover. And in the meantime, while Elon works to turn us all into cyborgs, Billy the Space Marine's best bet may be meditation. Somehow it fits. At the end of the day, the Astartes are warrior monks. A 2010 study published in the Journal of Behavioral and Brain Function showed in long-term meditators, multiple hours spent in meditation are associated with a significant decrease in total sleep time when compared with age and sex match controls who did not meditate. There are narrative accounts of experienced meditators claiming that sleeping less often can be the result from meditative skill and progress. But really, for monks, we've been doing this uh, for the last 2,600 years. Buddhist texts suggest that proficient meditators sleep around four hours a night. And for us, we it's not trendy. <laughs> it really is just a lifestyle that we use to train ourselves, and it's been going on for centuries. We may get a clearer picture if we take a trip to the Atlantic Ocean. Enter the dog. I'm not kidding. These marine mammals experience a phenomenon called unihemispheric sleep, shutting off sections of their brain while remaining alert through the active use of the other sections. Sounds a lot like space marines. And slow wave sleep EEG brain waves during this phenomenon look a lot like deep alpha brain wave patterns experienced by advanced meditators. Perhaps a deep enough meditation inducing sufficient alpha brain waves would reduce the need for sleep. The restful alertness you might experience in a state of alpha brain waves is associated with decreased heart rate, reduced metabolism, and changes to the nervous system that reduce arousal that occurs during sleep. According to headspace.com, neuroimaging studies are beginning to support the idea that meditation practice promotes greater wakefulness and lower sleep propensity as it progresses in intensity. Okay, interns, that's six of the 19 organs, and I think we've run out of time for today's class. I'll be back in a few weeks to continue transforming the now 15-year-old Billy into a hardened Astartes warrior. Let's just hope Billy survives a little longer than his brother here. Keep your eyes open as I'll be back in a few weeks to tackle another portion of the Astartes implants. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. And if you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.